בוקר טוב. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the panel discussion honoring Reporters Sans Frontières, or known as RSF, on the occasion of the organization receiving the 2019 Dan David Prize. The international Dan David Prizes are awarded by the Dan David Foundation in cooperation with Tel Aviv University. The awards cover three time dimensions, the past, the present, and the future. The RSF received the award in the present category. RSF is a Paris-based independent NGO founded in 1985. Its bureaus in 10 cities, including Brussels, Washington, Berlin, Tunis, Rio de Janeiro, and Stockholm, and its network of correspondents in 130 countries give it the ability to mobilize support, challenge governments, and wield influence on the ground and where media and internet standards and legislation are drafted. RSF's motto is that freedom of expression and information will always be the world's first important, most important freedom. If journalists were not free to report the facts, denounce abuses, and alert the public, how would we resi resist problems such as children soldiers, torture of uh, defending women's rights, or preserve our environment? In some countries, torturers stop their atrocious deeds as soon as they are mentioned in the media. In others, corrupt politicians abandon their illegal habits when investigative journalists publish compromising details about their activities. Still elsewhere, massacres are prevented when the international media focuses, attention on focuses its cameras on such events. RSF has distinguished itself in the protest during the Beijing Olympics in Africa by creating the only independent radio station broadcasting in Eritrea, in, ha in Haiti by creating a media support center after the 2010 <laughs> and more recently the more, uh, in Syria by providing training to journalists and bloggers. Every day, RSF issues press releases and reports in several languages about the state of freedom of information throughout the world and how it is being violated. Its statements in the international media increase public awareness and influence leaders regarding both individual cases and general issues. RSF has received numerous prestigious awards from social, political, media, and academic organizations. And now, the latest award, the 2019 Dan David Prize, that recognizes its, its achievements that shape and enrich society today. Each year, RSF publishes its World Press Freedom Index as an evaluation and advocacy tool. Recent years have seen a marked increase in government reactions to the index, including greater attention they pay to freedom of information. The index is also increasingly used by bodies such as the UN Refugee Agency and the World Bank in determining the allocation of developmental aid. So joining us this morning are four distinguished individuals. First and foremost, I'd like to welcome Monsieur Christophe Delois, Secretary General of RSF. Congratulations to you and the RSF for receiving this esteemed award. Monsieur Delois is a journalist, author, and publisher. From 2008 to 2012, he was head of the Centre de Formation des Journalistes, the Paris Training Center for Journalists. Since 2012, he has been serving as Director General of RSF. Justice Dalia Dorner retired from the Israeli Supreme Court in 2004 after sitting on the court for 11 years. Since 2006, she has been serving as president of the Israeli Press Council and has taught courses on human rights at several institutions of higher learning. 
She has been conferred Dr. Honoris Causa by Weizmann Institute of Science and Ben-Gurion University, and she just told me that next week she will be conferred one more time by the University of Haifa. Aluf Ben works for Haaretz, an independent daily considered by many as the New York Times of Israel. Formerly an investigative reporter and diplomatic and political commentator, he has been with Haaretz since 1989 in a variety of roles, culminating in his appointment as editor-in-chief in 2011. Finally, Efrat Peres Lakter is a news reporter correspondent currently with Israel's Channel, TV, Channel 12 TV, where she is part of the Friday evening news magazine team. She has done significant investigative journalism and covered events in several world hotspots, including Iraq, Africa, and China. And we take special pride in the fact that if Efrat is a graduate of our own Department of Communication here at Tel Aviv University. Now to our discussion. There is a Hebrew expression, makom tov ba'emtza, a good place in the middle, that typically connotes something fairly good, not extreme in any direction. While Israel is considered among leading nations on several fronts, its ranking by the RSF World Press Index during the past five years has reigned between 87 and 101 among 180 countries. This is definitely not such a good place in the middle. Here is what the 2019 report said about Israel, ranking last year in 88th place. The report is titled, Corruption, Military Censorship, and Self-Censorship. And now I will quote from the report. The Israeli media are free to be outspoken, which is rare in the Middle East. Nonetheless, despite the existence of independent media, Journalists are subjected to military censorship, orders banning coverage of certain subjects, private sector lawsuits designed to gag them, and open hostility from members of the government. The Israeli parliament has begun considering a proposed amendment under which according, recording or disseminating photos or video of, several, of serving Israeli soldiers with a demonstrable aim of undermining the spirit of IDF soldiers and res residents of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Israel or intending to harm state security would be punishable by five to 10 years in prison. Because of self-censorship, there is little or no coverage of the reality of life in the Palestinian territories. Foreign freelancers often have difficulties in obtaining or renewing accreditation. The Israel Defense Forces often violates the rights of Palestinian journalists, especially when they are covering demonstrations in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Two Palestinian journalists were killed by IDF snipers and dozens were wounded while covering the March of Return protests in the Gaza Strip in 2018. Under Israel's system of administrative detention, Palestinian journalists can be held indefinitely without formal charges and without notification of a lawyer, and on the grounds that they are inciting violence or cooperating with terrorist organizations. The IDF have harassed or closed many Palestinian media outlets in recent years for allegedly inciting violence." Unquote. So, as social scientists studying communication, four central questions come to mind. First, how is the World Press Freedom Index created, thereby placing Israel in the 88th place? How are the various qualitative elements converted into quantitative rankings? This question I will ask, I will mainly ask Monsieur Delois to relate to. In your view, second, in your view, is the RSF citation about Israel a fair representation of Israeli democracy and its media? This question will be to all four panelists. The third question, how would you describe the Israeli situation in a comparative framework, taking other countries into account? And I would refer this question first to Efrat Lakhter. 
And finally, what are the prospects for improving Israel's ranking in the index in the foreseeable future? And that again for all panelists. So, without further ado, Monsieur Deloire, could you possibly respond to the question, how is the World Press Freedom Index created? And give us an explanation, thereby placing Israel in the 88th place last year. Thank you so much for, for your... Yeah. Okay, do I, do I have to start again? <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Akiba Cohen, uh, for your introduction. I'm really delighted and honored to be with uh, such uh, distinguished panelists and uh, to be with you this morning uh, in the Tel Aviv University. I will start, if you allow me to, to pay a tribute to the memory of, of Dan David, and, and to the family, to Gabriella, um, to Ariel, for their commitment, for their general commitment beyond journalism, and of course for uh, the award we got, which is for us very important in very difficult times for journalism, and especially, of course, for quality journalism. And just before I answer your question, and I will answer your question, just I would like to explain that the, the challenges we face are much more complicated than they used to be. I would say that the world of yesterday was more simple. Not so good, but more simple. We had to face despotic regimes with classical violations of press freedom. They put journalists in jail, they threatened them. Other groups killed journalists. It didn't disappear. We could believe that thanks to the new technologies, these classical violations of the rights of journalists would disappear. In fact, right now, there are in the whole world around 350 journalists in jail. Last year, 80 journalists were killed in the course of their jobs just for investigating reporting, not only in war zones, but also in countries that are supposed to be in peace. In Mexico, in Turkey, the most famous example is, of course, Jamal Khashoggi, who was dismantled in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. But every year, journalists are dismantled, dismembered in Mexico because they investigate crime. And even in Europe, and Europe is supposed to be the continent where the press freedom is at the highest level, journalists were killed in the past two years. Investigative journalists, they had this in common. They investigated Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta. She investigated tax evasion, corruption. And then in Slovakia, Jan Kusiak. And Jan Kusiak, never went to war zones, even never met with dangerous sources. He was a data journalist. He just compared reports of the European Union, <coughs> reports in his country, Slovakia, made analysis, and he was killed for this by mafia guys. So the situation is worsening. This is the classical, these are the classical violations and there is an increase. I would call it the visible prisons. And then you have another level, the invisible prisons. No blood, no bars, but constraints on information. Control of news and information through money, technology, or laws that can seem to be soft. There is no identified victim. You cannot say this journalist was a victim, but our right to information is violated. When oligarchs, and when I say oligarchs, I do not mean Russian oligarchs, but all over the world, in India, in Turkey, in Latin America, go buying in the media 
to use it for their influence or just to serve the interests of the presidents of their countries. That's the case, for instance, even in Turkey. Turkey has been a laboratory for the reduction, the abolishment of pluralism through many, many ways. Even just friends of Erdogan bought media outlets and totally changed the editorial lines. It wasn't for their interests, because of course, when you change the editorial line, um, the audience doesn't follow, so the media outlets disappear. These are the invisible prisons. And then we have another topic, which is even bigger, which is that we now live in a sort of, on a global scale, we live uh, in a news and information jungle. Safeguards were established in 1948. This was an important year for different reasons. Uh, 1948, because it was also year, the year of the adoption of, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the safeguards for news and information were established on a national level through constitutional guarantees, media laws, invisible for the public but with many virtues, and self-regulation. And those guarantees are swept away, those safeguards. We have to rebuild it. So that's the challenges we have to face. Now, the World Press Freedom Index. I could have three types of answer. I will give only one. The first type of answer is about the methodology. I could tell you very long how we work. Or we have a questionnaire, an online questionnaire in 20 languages with a qualitative methodology, specialists of all the countries that um, answer 100 questions and we produce this index. I could have a psychological answer. I have to say that and I'm sorry to say this, but that in many, many countries, people say, oh, our country should be better ranked. I guess even in Finland, they are second this year, they believe that they should be first. And last, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, first one is Norway. And um, three weeks ago, I was one, in one of the worst countries on earth, really, there is a blackout on media, and we, the journalists say to me, oh, we are free in our country. There are around 40 journalists in jail, propaganda, etc., but they believe they, they should be much higher. So this is a second answer. The third answer is about reality, and that, I guess this is um, the answer you would like to have. If you compare is, um, Israel with other countries, in fact, things are happening in these countries that do not happen in, other, in some other countries. It doesn't happen in all the countries that you have bill, uh, billboards um, on the roads with the faces of journalists, saying they will not decide. Of course they will not decide. This is not their role. But this is an intimidation. This doesn't happen in all the countries that you have so uh, tough speeches against journalists. It happens in some countries, we can say this, even in the US, but not in all the countries. It is not true in all countries that you cannot, as a journalist, and beyond this as a citizen, go to the zone just across the border to visit it and report it, a report about it and know what happens there. I, of course, intend the fact that uh, journalists are not allowed to go together. It doesn't happen in all the countries that uh, you have such uh, corruption or attempts, cases, with clear negotiations. And with also, it happened, clear violations of editorial independence. So I could have a longer list. And uh, yes, we, 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 we do believe that this 88th ranking is um, deserved, I would say, uh, legitimate. And uh, of course, we would like this to be much better. But as you said, as compared with other countries in the region, this is better. But is this enough? I'm not sure. OK, why don't we open this up now for? responses by the other panelists.
the general question of are we, do you think that this is a representative um, picture of the situation here in Israel? Who wants to begin? Oof. Good morning again. Thanks for the Dan David Prize and the University for, for inviting us to talk about this important topic. Well, you know, I can't really compare us with the 87th place or 86th, and, uh, and, and, uh, but clearly you touched upon some issues that are representative of our problems here. Military censorship. Uh, military censorship has been a constraint on Israeli media forever, since, uh, since the British mandate. And uh, its main effect on us is twofold. First of all is stuff that you don't even bother to cover or to investigate because you say it's, not, it's never going to pass censorship. The main issue, however, that censorship uh, is, is really leaning upon us in our, in our daily lives is not so much coverage of what happens in the territories. The problem of the coverage of uh, the Israeli occupation is not by the censorship, it's not by even by the government or by the courts or by libel laws or anything like that. It's because I believe that the Israeli public, the Hebrew reading, the Hebrew watching, the Hebrew listening public doesn't want to be bothered by it, doesn't want to hear about it, and most of the media barely reports about it, most of the time. This is not because of government intervention. It's not as if the government is encouraging it. The government doesn't like to talk about it either. Uh, government ministers don't give briefings about what we did to extend the occupation this morning. And even when Israel uh, reaches ceasefire agreements with Hamas in Gaza, we have to watch the announcement by Hamas because the Israeli government doesn't feel that it has to report it to its own citizens. But most of the problem of censorship is what I call ambiguities. The stuff that the Israeli government doesn't like to acknowledge or to take responsibility for and, uh, and imposes it upon, uh, upon the media by forcing us to quote foreign sources. Two main issues, uh, historically, uh, Israel's nuclear program. Uh, but this is not so much covered because not much is happening there, I guess, news-wise. Uh, it's mostly about ancient history, that, you know, we still have to argue with them about uh, stories about stuff that happened in 1967. The other issue that is more relevant and prevalent is cross-border operations. When, uh, when we hear that, like, last night, uh, the night before that, that mysterious bombings were, were heard in Damascus, and the Syrian government reports that, it that its forces intercepted uh, Israeli missiles. Uh, there's no responsibility. No Israeli official takes responsibility for that. And the Israeli media is not allowed to publish that this was an Israeli attack, only quoting foreign sources or the Syrian government or whoever. Only when something gets wrong or when for some reason, a senior politician or military officer uh, likes to take credit for our successful operations against the Syrians, against the Iranians in Syria, whatever. Then, out of the sudden, no censorship. And when you complain about that, you, know, you say, okay, you can be as ambiguous as you want, but why, why do you force us to play that role? They say, well, because of the existence of censorship, whatever is published in Israel from Israeli sources amounts to an official declaration. So we are presumably independent, but on issues of matters of national security, we are supposed to be organs of the government. And that's the main issue. I must say, however, that you know, I made my career fighting censorship uh, and based the most successful uh, case limiting the scope, of, the scope of censorship in Israel, is the Schnitzer case, is based on a story of mine in a Supreme Court ruling of 30 years ago. Since then, the Supreme Court failed to intervene, and in all cases, when the media appealed to the Supreme Court against rulings of the sense of the military censorship, in all cases, with no exception, 
the justices told the journalists to step back and said, if you don't want us to rewrite the Schnitzer case in a more limited way, back off. So there is no real legal protection uh, for the media uh, if, you, if you argue with the censorship. You have to negotiate with them. Uh, the, only, the only caveat in this picture uh, came to me in this position. First of all, as editor, you see things uh, differently than as a writer who wants to publish everything. As an editor, you have different responsibilities. And five years ago, when the Snowden case exploded in the US and Britain, and I, and I witnessed the extent by which my American and British colleagues censored themselves in, in publishing the Snowden material because they were afraid of being prosecuted for harming national security, in Israel, once you play by the censorship rules, you have, you have zero liability. So, so I don't have to uh, be afraid to be prosecuted for harming national security if, if I submit stuff to censorship. Uh, I think the broader, the broader problem that we're facing here uh, is twofold, uh, threefold. First of all, uh, a general attitude by the Netanyahu government against what the Prime Minister calls the media by which he means any, uh, any media that is critical of him. Uh, I don't think that he includes the pro Netanyahu media as part of the media, but the media is the enemy of the state, the media wants to overthrow the government, the media does that, the media says that, when, you know, with, with, uh, with Trump in power and the, the use of the cliche fake news about everything critical is prevalent here, just as in the United States. So that's one, one attitude. Uh, it's not, again, it's not necessarily a problem. Look at the New York Times. They won over a million new di digital subscribers because of that. We are not uh, as successful. But, but uh, the more natural position for journalists and for, for media organization is the opposition. So this is, this is an issue, but it's not necessarily a problem. The bigger problem is the efforts and the declared policy of the newly elected government that is, is yet to be formed, but I think there's a wide agreement among its uh, uh, participants in the coalition that the limit, the independence of the Israeli Supreme Court should be, should be limited. And since pr 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 uh, freedom of the press in Israel is only enshrined, was based, created and enshrined in Supreme Court rulings, any, uh, any undermining of the independence of the Supreme Court uh, would, harm, would harm freedom of the press. And last but not least, there's an attitude uh, in the mainstream media, uh, which they call uh, um, shutting the door to extremists from both right and left, and trying not to be too critical and not to make their viewers and readers angry you know, in times of, of, uh, social, of social networks, you don't want to be on either side. You want to play it safe, and, uh, a bad place in the middle, to use your word. And, uh, and, and we feel that every, every time that we publish something that is away from the mainstream, mostly in the opinion section, we get criticized all over the place. And, and I wonder why, why are these colleagues, competitors of ours, trying so hard to limit the discussion rather than to use it uh, to, to uh, enrich the debate. But they don't want to do that. And the fourth point, last but not least, the impact of social networks, of internet giants on freedom of the press is the biggest challenge to all of us everywhere in the world. Uh, the fact that they are eating up the economic base of, of uh, news organizations, turning more and more new, news organizations into kind of, uh, not exactly NGO, but loss-making enterprises. Uh, and that affects its, uh, editorial independence. The best way to achieve editorial independence was in the old days, the classifieds. Millions of advertisers, none of them could have any direct influence on you. Uh, now advertising is disappearing moving to Google and Facebook. More and more of the, of the uh, dissemination of information uh, goes to Google and Facebook, and they have their own rules, and they growingly tell you what to say and what not to say. They're even encouraged to do that because they were blamed for the rise of Donald Trump. 
And I think this is the major issue that all of us would have to deal with, uh, regardless if you're 88 or 87 or even number one or two. And by the way, in Norway, in Norway is the one place when the lo where the local media, uh, the um, Stipsted, which is the biggest uh, media group there, was able to, to compete with Google and Facebook. They're not as strong in Norway as they are in the rest of the world. Just point but I think there's no better point in shifting now to Justice Dorner, who, to remind you, former Justice of the Supreme Court, currently the President of the Israeli Press Council. So I wonder how you would like to respond to these. These uh, Aluf Ben uh, told you the day-to-day -day problems of the journalist. I want uh, to speak from a legal point of view. And now Israel is an open society. We enjoy an independent judiciary, strong Supreme Court, and a vibrant and pluralistic press. Nevertheless, it's not easy to be a journalist in this country. We have no what you call First Amendment in the United States. And nor a strong belief in free press. I'll speak about the role of the public opinion. It's very important. Then, our freedom of press is not protected by a constitution. Our democracy is weak. We have no enough checks and balances. Our, we have basic laws, but they are not entrenched so that our governing majority has the power to change the rules of the game and to control, take control of democratic institutions, the media, the judiciary, uh, civil society. Now, this power was not used because we are not governed by one party, but by a coalition. And all the years, the coalition consisted at least of one liberal party. But times are fickle. Nowadays, and there were several, in my view, several uh, laws adopted by the late Knesset who chip away for our democracy. So, why is it? Because we need a constitution. We need an entrenchment of the basic laws. And if we have not this, there is a weakness. And if I speak of freedom of speech, what happens with, with the journalists? I, there are no laws uh, uh, against uh, the freedom of speech, still. Uh, I'm not uh, much worried about uh, military censorship. Because uh, you can always apply, you are not happy with the result, but you can always apply to our court, to independent court, and it decides what it decides. The main uh, issue is that we don't let, I hope, I hope we, do, we do our best to use this power for political reasons. Military reasons, security, you know, it's in our country, I think in every country, sacred. People die, there is a war, security. Court must take it into account. But it's a question of public opinion. Now, nowadays, as I say, times are fickle, and the uh, members of the ruling majority uh, compete with each other, attacking the press. Um, Netanyahu, uh, his attacks uh, are not only f against the media in general and specifically journalists and really it endangers them because public opinion, as I told you, is not a strong belief in free press. Everyone wants free, free, uh, free speech for himself but not for his opponent and uh, we know these things. So. That's not only personal revenge. It, it, uh, they, uh, I think the idea is to, uh, 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 by these attacks, uh, to control uh, 
public discourse, a reporting of the news, and the judiciary. And the judiciary. There are several ideas. So ju if I say judiciary in general, specifically uh, the Supreme Court. And uh, well, uh, if th these attacks influence the public opinion, um, I think uh, it was George Orwell who wrote uh, in the preface of his book, uh, Animal Farm, that the uh, danger to free thought and speech is not the direct interference of the government, but public opinion. So brings that uh, inconvenient facts will be kept dark and unpopular ideas will be dismissed uh, by self-censorship. And I'm afraid that there is, I look at it, there is a certain censorship self-censorship in this country. You spoke about it. And it's for also for economic reasons, because there is also this problem. So all said, what can we do? The most important thing to, in my country at least, but because journalists are, are not uh, in, in jail, thank God, still, is public opinion. And this attacks of a popular uh, prime minister, they influence the public opinion. And we must fight against it. We, in the press council, see our main job to try to explain to our public the importance of the freedom of speech, freedom of the press. They won't be always the, uh, the majority. What will they will also be one day the minority. And the freedom of press protects the country and the freedom of every one of us. And, uh, well, I'm an optimist. I must be at my age. So let us hope for the best. Would you comment both on the general uh, report of the RSF, but given your expertise in the international scene, perhaps you want to elaborate on how you see Israel vis-a-vis -vis other countries ranked, I guess, below the 88th place in the, in the index. All right, so um, also thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really a great honor to be here, and I admire your work. And so I read your report and I was uh, checking to see the countries I've been to. So maybe what I'm going to say is a little biased because, as I found out, I worked at 11 countries that you find as uh, difficult, and such as Iraq, Turkey, um, Ethiopia, Uganda, and three countries you find in a very serious condition, which is uh, Syria, Egypt, and uh, China. So this is my point of view. Uh, and I would like to share three stories um, that will give examples to those things. So the first one is um, three years ago, two and a half years ago, I was covering the war against ISIS in Mosul in Iraq. And I got there, uh, my job was to be embedded to the Kurdish forces. Now, I've been embedding uh, to Israel forces during the war, and I can say it's a whole different story. Because in Israel, when you're embedded uh, in a war, the, first of all, the forces have a sort of responsibility to your safety. Now, as a journalist, I don't want to be limited. I don't want other people to tell me where I can go or I cannot go. But on the other hand, it's pretty good that you have someone who says, listen, I am responsible. You're in my car. I'm taking you from place to place. But I will also give you information about what's going on. Okay, so in Israel, the Israeli forces, they give you information, numbers, uh, the progress of the war. You have to check everything, not everything is accurate. I have a lot of criticism about the idea of spokesman unit, but you, they are trustworthy most of the time in, war, in the field, I'm saying. When I went to Mosul, there was nothing like it. Well, there was uh, instructions at first, when you come to the field, they tell you, okay, so this battle, like this specific battle is going to take two hours. We're going to crush ISIS. We'll be in and out. You're going to see it's going to be very easy. And once you go to the field, it takes 12 hours, 14 hours of, of heavy clashes, and no one is telling you what's really going on. 
the opposite. They do, will not tell you uh, how many casualties, how many wounded. They hide this information from you. Uh, they think that's part of their PR, right? Saying that everything is okay and the battle is going well. But as a journalist, first, it makes the risk you're taking even greater. I think that's part of the reason why so many journalists were killed in Syria and Iraq. And I can really see that happening. Because you walk into the field, you have no idea what's going on. They're not really telling you, and you might get into very dangerous places. Um, so that's first story. My st second story is from China. I was there uh, a month ago. I was actually doing a story which is... Uh, well, I wouldn't say positive, but it's not such a bad story uh, for the Chinese government. I did a story about the one-child policy that changed into two-child policy. And I came to a maternity hospital to speak with women who gave birth to their second child. And I was asking them, why are you having a second child? And how is it for you? And I was amazed, as an Israeli journalist, that everyone at first gave me the same answer. We're doing it because the government asked us to have a second child. Now, I don't believe any woman has children just because the government asked her to. Right? There must be some other reason. And after really getting into to knowing the people and off camera, you will hear different <coughs> reasons. But people in China really cannot speak their mind. And it's not people that are involved in political action. It's women that just gave birth uh, and still are so... They are so aware of what the government think of them and how much they have to be careful that it, it was amazing to me. Also, I was uh, filming outside on the street, uh, this interviewee. Now, I had all the certificate, certificates, all the paper. I was allowed to go there. I had a visa as a journalist coming to China, everything. I thought I'm fixed, no problems. And like three minutes into the interview, someone comes and he has no uniform, no badge. He's coming like a civilian start taking photos of us, of the car, of my interviewee. And she got really scared. And I said, why are you worried? This guy, what can, we, what can he do to us, right? But she said, no, no, we have to get out of here. Now in Israel, that can never happen. There's no way a, someone in a civilian, a civilian will come to you in the middle of, of an interview and scare you so, so badly. I don't know, maybe in the West Bank, but inside of Israel, I mean, the West Bank is a different story. But inside of Israel, that's something that can never happen. And last and third story, um, four years ago, I went to Uganda to interview the president of Uganda, Yuri Museveni. And also, I did a story about illegal arm trade, which is a sensitive thing, right? Illegal arm trade is always a sensitive thing. It's, it was a story about uh, arms being uh, sold from Israel to Uganda, but ending up in the uh, African uh, Central African Republic, which is a country under international embargo. So uh, being there after interviewing the president, I felt pretty safe. I was working with a local Ugandan uh, uh, reporter who told me that his life, life is in danger for working on this kind of issues. But I said, OK, but I just met the president. And the president is God in this country, so I'm, I'm good. Pretty soon, <laughs> I start understanding that I'm being followed everywhere, all the time. And the people who were following us didn't want to be unmentioned. They, they wanted us to feel their presence everywhere we went. And I, as I'm getting into the death of this story and asking more people and meeting arm dealers, which are not the nicest people, actually, um, I even got a threat that said, you know, for $50, we can have a car that will drive your car off a cliff. So you maybe want to stop asking questions around here. So I had to leave sooner than I thought. Again, this is something that could never happen here in Israel. I did stories about uh, Israel number one criminal, uh, Amir Mulner, and his influence on the city mayor of Ramat Gan, which is something that, and the, the police came out really bad from my report. And yet, I know that if I was threatened, I could have uh, gone to the police and have protection. No matter what I report about them, I would still feel safe in my house. So, um, we have a lot of problems, like uh, Elouf mentioned and Justice Dorner, and, um, and like you did too. And I, I'm really happy there is someone that keeps checking on us and making us, uh, and telling us we should improve, because we should improve. But in general, I feel very, very lucky. I'm a journalist in Israel and not in other places. And I feel like uh, I'm totally free here to do my job and, and get to the truth of things. Thank you. <laughs>
Mr. Derwa, I'm very surprised that you were so up to date about the billboards with the pictures of the journalists in our just prior to our recent election. So you must be getting information on a very updated basis. Having heard the three participants just now, has your view changed in any way? Uh, how do you react to what they have just said? And again, I'm not, tr not by any means trying to defend uh, our own situation here, which is not very simple at all. Um, uh, of course, I always learn on, on want to learn, and I think that positions were quite different, if I understood well. First, I think it, it, it would be, in any case, it wouldn't come to our mind to compare Israel and China. Really not, or, or, or even with, with Iraq. Uh, and I have to say that uh, China is not ranked um, 87th, but uh, 176 on 7th, or, or 7th. So, one of the four worst countries on earth. So, yeah, it has nothing to do. Um, but I would like to react to, to something, in fact, to... to, to yes. To try to mix your, your two. <laughs> we um, about the fact that one problem that all the, the democracies have now in common, which is uh, the platforms Facebook, Google, and, and it's related to the question of the checks and balances. Yes. Because what happens in that our public square, I could say the square of the village, where we exchange information, ideas, etc. in democracies, was managed with checks and balances. The rules were established by parliaments, by the constitution by the people itself when they adopted constitutions. And um, now, this square of the village is managed by platforms. And it's a huge change of paradigm. The people who create the norms, the architectures of choices, who say where we can put the chairs, the tables, who can sit where, for some topics remain our parliaments, but for a lot of topics are now two, I would quote, two very different guys. On one side, Mark Zuckerberg, when he changes his algorithm, he changes the laws. Code is low, you know this, but two. And on the other side, it can be, it will be in the future, um, Xi Jinping. Because China has also its platforms. I do not compare Mark Zuckerberg and uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping. It would make sense. But uh, they go Weibo and other platforms. They go to other markets. And there, this is a huge risk for democracies. Because can we accept that Mark Zuckerberg or Xi Jinping have the power to say what we can see, what we cannot see? To introduce a bias, the difference between democracies and other regimes is that if you go to Iran, there is a huge bias in the public sphere. If you go to China, there is a huge bias in the public sphere. And when Weibo, the Chinese platforms, work overseas, they keep this bias. In democracies, normally there is no political or ideological or religious bias. So. How do we secure those safeguards? How, how do we impose them now to platforms? This is a key question. Otherwise, our democracies will be like, um, it, remains, it reminds me um, like a, a painting of, of the famous Spanish painter Goya. You see two people 
you can see this painting in the Prado Museum if, if in Madrid. You, you, you see two guys, they beat each other with weapons. They are obsessed with the other guy. They want to beat him. They do not see that they have a common enemy. And the common enemy is a quick sense. And both of them are sinking into the quick sense. And that's a bit what our democracies can do. And so we have to avoid that there are quick sense. And for this, we have to establish a new system of safeguards adapted to the globalized and digitalized information and communication space. And that's uh, what we work on with the Initiative on Information and Democracy that has been endorsed by 12 heads of government and state <laughs> last November and which will be in the agenda of the next G7 summit in Biarritz, France, uh, next August. So we really try to create a sort of framework with safeguards to avoid that, to defend people, journalists, knowing that in any case they will lose the game because the rules of the game are against them. You know, I understood that uh, several years ago, you know, one thing that is totally banned on Facebook is nudity. And we published a story about uh, an exhibition by Micha Baram, uh, Israel's, I think, most famed war photographer. And uh, the picture we put on our weekly magazine and on our Facebook, our its Facebook feed, was of a reservist soldier taking a shower from, uh, from a jerry can on the other side of the Suez Canal. You could see some nudity if you looked very hard. A reader complained to Facebook, uh, immediately they shut your page for 24 hours. And then you have to find someone who knows someone in Facebook because there is no court of appeals in Facebook. So eventually we were allowed to run again. But clearly you're not going to test the system again uh, and its rules which are, which, are, which are known, they publish them. And that told me that the best way to protect uh, editorial freedom is to have your own distribution system. Because if you want to rely on the, you know, it's cheaper and easier to rely on the algorithm of someone else. But then, as you said, the algorithm, the algorithm is changed. No one tells you about it. No one explains it to you. If, you, if you're not able to sell your, your product to your customers, you're not going to survive. Or you're not going to be free. You can only publish, I don't know, about the Eurovision uh, your vision uh, contest and uh, not very critical stuff there as well. And I think this is critical. Economic independence and especially independent distribution are the key to editorial freedom. No less than, you know, governments, do good governments uh, protecting us from Google and Facebook. They're not as strong and, and, and as, as Justice Donna said, they can change from a very democratic pro-media governments uh, to the other side. It can happen too. We see it in some places. What can I say? I, uh, I come back. Uh, we <laughs> comparing us to China and Uganda, I think it's a better place. But <laughs> I want us to compare us to Finland. <laughs> Finland will be excellent. I didn't work in Norway. <laughs> no, Norway, Norway, Norway are the best. Well, I thought that Finland, they, they, they were offended, no? They were only That's second. And and we want, I mean, even our right-wing government... Let, I, one interruption. In, in psychology, you talk about just noticeable differences. Now, the rankings are one, two, three. The question is, is there a noticeable difference between the first and the second and the second and the third? Probably not that much. Who is number two after Norway? Um, Finland. Finland. Ah. What now, what's the difference between the two? No, it's it's very. In, I have to, uh, to say it's very difficult. To, to, but uh, what happened is that Finland was be, first. It must be number two. Yeah. Who's number yeah. two to Usain Bolt? Uh, um, no, either. No, no. It, it's it's sometimes it's difficult to rank. But, but what happened is Finland was first for for uh, six years, seven years, um, and then there were interventions by the Prime Minister of Finland on uh, Wajali. 
which is uh, the Finnish um, public TV. Uh, he tried to interfere with the content, and that's why, uh, but uh, Wiley uh, totally resisted. But uh, just for one phone call, there, it was a big case in, in, in Finland, and that's why two years ago they came um, to the fourth place and then came back to the second. So sometimes things happen. And, and in Sweden, for instance, as, as compared to, to, to Norway, uh, you have uh, a lot of trolls who intimidate journalists. Uh, uh, there is more hate speech against journalists than, than in Norway. So these countries are not perfect, and we can, but as compared, uh, we, we, we can consider that there is a, a sort of Nordic model. Just uh, want to make my point. Now, what can can we do? I mean, your report is important for my country because we, even our right wing government, wants uh, a nice face. They want to be a democracy, the best one, uh, the be the villa in. Okay. Uh, so they, uh, as Orwell said, uh, inconvenient facts will be kept dark. So we won't use, let us say, the work occupation. It's not nice. So there is a power of such reports because we want to be beautiful. We want to be nice. Uh, my problem, our problem is public opinion. They don't like free speech. I mean, they like, generally. Uh, I think the last survey of our uh, uh, Israel Democratic Institute showed that only 31% trust the media. And among the Arabs, more trust the media about our Arab citizens than, uh, uh, than uh, 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 the Jewish citizens. 31%. It's, it's a very low uh, percent. And uh, therefore, I'm worried because we, we, we get along with the, the laws if they won't change it. Because as I explained it, uh, our, uh, uh, we, we, our lack of constitution gives the power to change the rules of the game. So. Let us hope for the best. I must be an optimist. But I am very much for public opinion. We in the in press council, we try, we go to, to the periphery, we meet with people, just small towns, explain to people the importance of the freedom of press. What you have, the power that we have got, that we have got, and you have got in your report, is that Israel wants to be a democracy, even the right-wing government. It gets offended if you call them that uh, we are a weak democracy. That's an offense. I explain why, but it is hard <laughs> to get an understanding. Why? We have free elections. We have, uh, I don't know how many parties, how many have we got? Enough. <laughs> I thought that you as an editor of Haaretz knows. I lost, I lost the count. And really, we are also a vibrant society, and the, the government is criticized freely. We must understand it. It's a, a problem with the, uh, with the uh, territories. That's another matter, because it's a political matter. I won't touch it. I am still a justice, even retired. But returning back to the freedom of press, without which there is no democracy and, there are, uh, and really no free elections. If you can't criticize freely, then you have not got free elections. I return to the public opinion. Every one of us must do something also in the academia. You have your students, you must educate them. I myself teach, understand that not only their ideas and their opinions count, also, the opinion of the other side, the opponent. Is, is there anything realistic, not in theory, but something realistic that could be done in Israeli society to educate people, to, to try and make them more aware of the 
needed democracy that is is under stress in this country right now? Is there something that you see can be done? Or is it a lost case? Look, I don't think that anything is a lost case. First of all, we have a very changed uh, media landscape uh, in the past uh, decade or two decades than, than there used to be. You know, where, when I grew up, there was a single TV channel in black and white uh, with Chaim Yavin, the anchor, telling us what the news was, and that was it. And everything else uh, grew out of that lineup. You know, to this day, the lineup in all newscasts in Israel begins with the conflict, the external conflict, and then the political conflict, and then, and then you know, down to economics, uh, police news, uh, culture, and uh, weather forecast. This could have been different. The centrality of the conflict was decided by someone, I don't know, back then, and to this day, nobody challenges that order of priorities. But now we have a much more uh, vibrant uh, media landscape because we have, uh, we have media channels for the ultra-Orthodox, for the national religious, for left-wingers, for right-wingers. It's more democratic than, than it used to be. And there are people in Israel who yearn to return to the, what we call the campfire model of one anchor telling us uh, everything we should know and what the news was. Uh, I think I think this is wrong. Number two, look when you when you read the the prime minister's criminal cases, and you and you notice that he got into trouble for media manipulation, which means that as much as, uh, as you know people don't trust the media, people don't like the media, people say politicians say nasty things about the media. It, if, if it's not sidelined, if the prime minister was risking going to prison in order to manipulate the coverage in, in the two main uh, news sites in Israel, which says something about the centrality of media despite all the, you know, the eulogies that we hear day and night about it. Uh, is it perfect? It's not, but I think it's today more open than it used to be. And uh, when I hear about uh, education and education, I hear the, the old campfire once again with, you know, the authority. Give us back the authority. Don't challenge it. I think that it should be challenged. And I think it's far more pluralistic today, even if, even if uh, uh, a lot of that pluralism uh, is against whatever I believe in or whatever I would like the country to look like. I think it's more democratic. That's because you're a true democrat. There are those, there are many who would not... Yeah, but, this, but, but, but uh, the balancing act is that, you know, in Haaretz we get, uh, we get uh, the same amount of criticism from left-wingers, the supposedly more liberal, uh, as we get from right-wingers about how did you dare publish th that piece? How can you uh, dare publish... But most of the right-wingers don't read your newspaper. Well, even if they don't read it, you know, if you look, if you look at the Israel Ayom, the main uh, right-wing media in Israel, uh, they have a daily, a daily column uh, which is called the, the Daily Troll, which is 90% of the time quoting from Haaretz uh, op-eds and, uh, and tweets by Haaretz uh, writers and so on. So, you know, you can get, by, by being criticized elsewhere, you get, you get your message. So I, I don't think that we are that uh, that people don't notice what we do. But yes, the the general attitude in Israel is we don't want to shut shut down uh, the other opinion, censor it. People don't like balance. They couldn't care less about balance. All they want is that the the idea or the opinion that they dislike wouldn't be there. And uh, this is what we're facing. And uh, and I think that you should be as annoying to this side of the aisle as to the other side of the aisle. Uh, and I think this, this, is, this is what makes you relevant. And, uh, and that's why I don't like the campfire, and I don't like the idea that we don't like the extremists from both, from both right and left. Just not rock the boat. We have some time that we can open up for comments, brief comments or questions from our audience. Uh, would you... 
microphone. Yeah, if, um, hi. Uh, if I can sort of ask a broader question. Uh, Adil David, hi. Um, so you correctly uh, pointed out the danger uh, of uh, Mike Zuckerberg or Xi Jinping, you know, uh, manipulating the, uh, their algorithm or changing the rules and deciding what, uh, what we can see and what we can't see. Uh, but m so my question is, is this, so um, how does the balancing act work? Because on the other hand, uh, Facebook and, and other platforms have been blamed for providing a platform to, to fake news, to propaganda essentially, which is then used to destroy the authority and the trust in, in the mainstream media and is used by the same populace who want to silence the, the, the mainstream media and the free media. And, and a lot of the sort of uh, attempts to, to control what can be seen and what cannot be seen on these platforms like Facebook is, is a reaction to that spread of uh, fake news and propaganda. So, so where do you draw the line and how do you draw the line between, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a catch-22, uh, because on one hand you can't, uh, you can't censor, you, can't, uh, you don't want Facebook to decide what we can't see, but then if they don't decide, you get this flood of propaganda and fake news. So what do you do? Thank you. Well, it's a part of uh, freedom of speech and there is the law uh, who, th that's what I told about checks and balances. There, are, there, there is uh, forbidden speech. Incitement is forbidden by law. So, if the law doesn't forbid, you have the right, if, if I don't like it, I don't like it. If really it harms the society, then there is the parliament, and it takes into account that it's against a very important human right, freedom of speech, so we must be very careful forbidding speech, but it is, there is forbidden speech, and that's uh, the world. Uh, not campfire, the problem is, but education that I mean, the understanding that the other side has also the right to talk what he wants to. I am afraid of self-censorship. Because uh, not every journalist writes in Aretz, and people look for work. And I feel there is sense. I hear also friends talking about, see, I don't want to go into this matter. It's not, it will not be good. Why not? It, they don't feel free. And that's the uh, checks and balances. Uh, I will add something. I think that... Uh, the legal systems are not totally adapted anymore to the new challenges. Because the question is not only are, are you allowed to say things or not, what are the exceptions, the legitimate exceptions according to the international standards to freedom of expression, it is that the algorithms they can really amplify things and it is even proven by, for instance, MIT studies, that they amplify extremist contents or false contents. So it creates new distortions of, com of competition, unfair competition by false information as compared with verified information. And this is totally new. And, and just, uh, um, I think we cannot just say that the algorithm is Facebook, is just protected by the freedom of expression of Mark Zuckerberg. Or that we just impose him to be a sort of editor-in-chief. We say you are responsible, as the editor-in-chief is responsible, it would be very dangerous because he would be like the editor-in-chief of the world, he could have his editorial line. We cannot give him this power. And I'm not opposed to the man himself, the question is not a person. And I do not totally agree with uh, I, the question you asked is absolutely key. There is something um, that I uh, differ on, is that this is not just a 
consequence, you, you, you said that um, uh, we, the, the fact that Zuckerberg has a power to, to make decisions is a consequence of the willingness of citizens to have him fa fight fake news. Or did I understand well? Yes, but it, it, yes, no, no, and, and but he, he, in fact, he has the power. Whatever we want, today he has the power, and we have our own contradiction. And I totally agree with you. And sometimes the same individuals have really contradictions. We say to him, "You have to be responsible, not to censor." And if you take off the content, this is censorship. You are really bad. On the contrary, if he uh, doesn't censor, we say, oh, you circulate hate speech. You should be responsible. So as citizens, we have to take our responsibilities and to be able to tell the principles that he has to comply with. We have to base his responsibility of something. And this work on the principles has, has not been done. And the rules were lost. We have to find the new rules. The history of democracy is, is an history of rules. Journalism is composed by rights and duties. There are some rules. That's what makes us useful for societies. And even I, I will question, uh, as we are in a, in a university, I will question the question. Um, I think that journalists can be considered as a fourth state, but their real social function is to be trusted third parties for societies in a very pluralistic way. Thanks to our work, to our methods, to our normally independence, to our compliance with ethical principles, normally this leads to free, independent and trustworthy news and information in a perfect world. Of course, there are a bit of differences sometimes. So how do we defend this? We have to, to, to find new ways um, because just to, to give you an example of totally new questions. You know Alexa and Siri, the two artificial um, intelligence uh, systems. Is it just the freedom of expression of the guys who produce it? Should Alexa and Siri be allowed, according to freedom of expression principles, to answer the question, is my prime minister or my president or my king uh, honest? For whom should I vote? Today, there is no rule. So we, can, we could live in a world tomorrow when in our homes we have the same devices and when we ask the question, for whom should I vote, they will say it. And they will totally introduce biases. So we have to find ways to address those totally new questions. Never happened to have such questions to solve in, in the past decades. Well, I agree with you, and I think that, um, uh, according, I mean, saying about uh, commenting about the, about Facebook, I think people today are learning that you can't trust what you read on Facebook the same way you can't trust that people are always in Thailand having a vacation there. They're also writing things that are, might be false, and I think that gives us uh, a greater responsibility as journalists, because this is actually what we have to, to offer. What we have to offer is the fact that we verify what we uh, publish, that uh, you can trust our publication, that we do some fact-checking, that we, do, we don't just put out there whatever there is without uh, doing a serious research. So I actually think it might be a good thing for our profession that we have to work harder, uh, we have to prove ourselves to our audience and buy their trust every day again and again. And I think that if you see in Israel, although I agree with Justice uh, Durner, there is a lot of uh, people that want to hear different opinions, 
But on the other hand, you see the rating is really high and people are watching the news every night. I don't know if, I don't think they watch the news the same way in most countries uh, in this high rates. So I think people still trust journalists, uh, even though they criticize them and that's only pushes us to work harder. And I just, I also wanted to refer to something that was in the report. One of the things that I think uh, hurt our ranking was the fact that there is uh, administrative uh, arrests in Israel, uh, that our Palestinian journalists are arrested. And I, I was thinking about it a lot, thinking how we can uh, improve in that uh, area, in that field. And thinking about a practical solution, I thought uh, I might know two Palestinian uh, journalists personally. We do not have connections with them. Uh, and maybe if there was a sort of a place, organization, NGO, something that would put us together in touch with them, and that's maybe something your organization can help uh, build. If I had a connection with Palestinian journalists and I would know them on a, on a personal base, I would know that if they were arrested, it's wrong. Now, I have a leverage of my government. I'm able to speak to, uh, you know, to the authorities and say, this guy, I know him. That's not right. He was arrested, and I'm can, I will publish this, and I will put pressure on you to stop, uh, to, to set him free. So, I think maybe if there was, if we would put a professionalism over nationalism in that point, uh, that might be a very helpful solution, and that can also uh, give us a better rank. Yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's a problem for them because <clears throat> they are banned by their own professional societies from engaging with us because that is considered. Normal, an act of normalization, and even and even our reporter Amira Haas was was taken off stage when she spoke at the Birzeit University a couple of years ago because that was seen as an act of normalization, and no Arab journalist from Jordan or from Egypt or from the Palestinian Authority is able to give an interview, an on-the-record interview to any Hebrew media or any Israeli media because they would face boycott in their own societies. It's not as easy. It's not as if they are banging on our door to engage with us, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's more of a problem for them. Two points on Facebook. First of all, one person's hate speech is another person's freedom fight. It's not as easy to discern uh, between them sometimes. And we have the case of the uh, Israeli airport during the tour was convicted or incitement, uh, and now she was acquitted uh, uh, of the one count of incitement with her poem, but st but still the the district court, the appeal, the court of appeals uh, upheld her conviction for two uh, for two Facebook posts in which she praised jihad. Last point was the, the most brilliant marketing idea by Mark Zuckerberg after the Trump election was when they were criticized for you know, being manipulated by the Russians and others and disseminating fake news. They said, okay, we'll outsource uh, the kosher stamp of uh, truth to external NGOs. They would check facts that were disseminated on Facebook and say if it's suspected fake news. Now this is brilliant, why? Because on one hand you say, okay, I'm not responsible, I outsource the kosher stamp to the liberal NGOs, they could verify it. And then if they say that something is suspected as fake news, that's the traffic magnet, uh, uh, as traffic magnet as you could think of, because if you see on your Facebook feed, this is uh, suspected fake news, what are you going to do? Immediately click it, because uh, it's, a, it's a good fairy tale. So you make, you, on one hand, you wash your hands off fake news and you get all the income uh, generated by fake news on your site. Win-win situation. Oh, oh, no, please go, please go. No, 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 no. Okay. What can I do? We have no Wikileaks. I think there are different Wikileaks, because if you have a look on the history of Wikileaks, there were really different periods. 
and uh, we have different opinions on the different periods. We do not have at all the same conception uh, or idea of um, what WikiLeaks did um, about the last uh, US election and what WikiLeaks did when they gave material to journalists to investigate about what happened in Iraq, for instance. Um, I think, of course, in, in, in democracies, we have to find balances. And, and uh, some secrets are legitimate, other ones are not. And um, we defended a lot Julian Assange when um, he was a source of journalists or acted as a journalist, we do not defend him on other behaviors. So I, I personally met with him a few times in the Ecuadorian embassy um, in London. And uh, we do consider that he should not be extradited, uh, expelled to the US for his journalistic activities. And in fact, for the moment, I have to say that the reason that is alleged by the US authorities is about what he did at the beginning. So uh, we do believe that it would be really a clear violation of, of press freedom if he would be expelled for these reasons, for his journalistic activities. I'm, I'm going to do this thing that we do in academic conference when we ask a question, but really we just state our opinion. And I want just to continue uh, Ariel's question. Uh, I think by now, two years after the Trump uh, election, research showed that fake news is not that big a phenomena and really had very little impact, and that our fear of algorithms is maybe to extend and the, I don't know, mania of fake news uh, was a bit bigger and um, what we do see is that user behavior drive this phenomena. For instance, uh, we had a research in this election and we saw that people believe fake news about uh, candidates for this election, but also fake news that was not circulating in social media, but stories that we invented because people want to believe no matter what. So, but I do think that Facebook has, is a bigger danger than we think, not about fake news that we worry so much, but mostly because, as Aluf said, it destroys the, the economic foundation of journalism and media organizations in a way that could not be restored. And what uh, Facebook do by uh, borrowing and taking content for free and limiting users from going to web uh, website of news organization and actually create profit for the things they do. They create content and Facebook just take it away. And by doing so, destroys every business model we have and leaves us with nothing. Okay. Well, there are several business models. One is uh, selling digital subscriptions, which is the, the New York Times model, and then you have the, the uh, sugar daddy, the Washington Post, Israel I.O. model. Uh, they exist. No, it, 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 you know, you have the richest man in the world buying the Washington Post. Well, he can survive uh, the economic downturn. He could compete with, with uh, Facebook, but we believe that he has other interests besides uh, producing good journalism. What do you want to do with it? Forbid it by law. I mean, uh, there is the rule of the law. And it's, uh, I, I always return to the question of checks and balances. But generally, if you forbid, let us say, publishing untruth, it's <laughs> Terrible, no? <laughs> what is untruth? Lies. Forbidden to publish lies. I, I had uh, one of the cases I heard, Janine Janine. The problem was uh, that the, was a film and soldiers uh, didn't like it because they weren't uh, put there uh, as nice guys. They said that were lies. And uh, I told them, sorry, 
the history will tell what is the lie. For you it is a lie, for the Palestinian it's the truth. He tells the story of the Palestinian. But what can you do? Fake news, it's, it, it can be very dangerous, I agree with you. The problem is, how do you decide to forbid something? It's a worldwide problem. It's not an easy problem. I don't think that this panel will find a solution, I'm afraid. Um, we, we really are at the point where we should close, but there's one more. May, may I just answer to, to this question? In fact, there are two types of regulations. There's content regulations, the question of should we forbid or not forbid, yes. and market regulation. And, and there is no market regulation. Yes. And before there was a sort of market regulation adapted to a sector, which in fact disappeared, because now there is direct competition between state propaganda, information sponsored by interest, advertising, quality journalism, remorse, etc. So how we do we find a way to, to solve it? And I continue, in fact, to answer to, to, to Ariel also. We also have disinformation campaigns, for instance, in the past elections in India, Mexico, etc. It went mostly through private emails, through WhatsApp, etc. And I will ask you the question. Does it remain freedom of expression when you say, send three million emails to people and the content does not depend on what you say, but on just the people who receive it? Does it have to comply with exactly the same principles? So, and, and all our regulations, they were based on distinctions that are now abolished. Public and private spaces, a different state media sectors, and even more and more, the distinction between human beings and artificial, in, and, and artificial intelligence. So we have really to rethink it, uh, I think. Uh, but if, if it's my last word, I will say that um, we could, uh, of course, uh, sp speak longer about the problems in Israel. I didn't speak about uh, the Palestinian journalists who are targeted, and I have to say this. but. You live in a country, and I have to say this, where Gabriela and Ariel will not be in jail for awarding the prize about democracy. In China, they wouldn't be in the room. <laughs> they would be in jail immediately. And this is not such this type of country. And this is good news. <laughs> um, I, I think that we need to close at this point. That actually, the discussion is getting much more uh, heated, but uh, time is up. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, distinguished guests and once again to congratulate uh, the uh, organization for the award. Thank you to the prize for coming. And uh, who's going to get the prize next year? We won't take you